Fred uh, from JMP. Uh, how do you pronounce your last name, Fred? Elijah. Elijah. <coughs> Thank you so much. You have the floor. My name is Fred Frederick Elijah. I'm with uh, JMP as a uh, general manager. Uh, I'm here to just introduce my uh, the company. We've been in business for about 25 years right now. And uh, we've been working for the city as a sub and as a prime for the past 15 years. And, uh, and that's all I have just to introduce my company. Then, uh, Steve, we said the rest. Hey, thank you so much for coming today. Appreciate your comments being under three minutes. <laughs> you know, I mean, my name is Steve Spears. I'm JP Paving. I'm a safety coordinator there, and I'm just here to voice some concerns JP has. Uh, they want a clarification on the uh, who can attend city hearings. Is there a written policy or something that we can get uh, in writing? Because evidently somebody was not allowed to attend a meeting that they the hearing that they had, and also Jane feel, uh, JP feels that. Uh, Minority-owned businesses might not be getting the same treatment as larger corporations, which makes it harder for JMP to also want to bring in small businesses up the ladder with them. And that's our concern. Okay. Um, so during the agenda item, we'll uh, be able to dig deeper into uh, those concerns. Thank you for coming. <coughs> Scott from the FCC. <clears throat> what is your first name, Ms. Scott? My name is Lucille Scott. Lucille Scott. Mm -hmm. Fair yeah. Contracting Coalition, but FCC is Yes. Right. Thank you. And what I would like to, uh, <clears throat> I would like to request that Alvin America and Agents be included on <clears throat> the PDL. My tax dollars should not be used by the city of San Antonio to exclude or discriminate against U.S. We have fought too long for equal rights on mayor. Our mayor and our city manager should make sure of this point. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, thank you so much for attending. Uh, and your comments are, are heard. Um, next, we will have um, Keith A. Tony, uh, two council candidates. <laughs> Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, my perspective as a former city councilman in District 2 is unique. And I can tell you that we want and we need real economic development. Now, I'm an old Vietnam veteran. I'm an, I'm an Army guy. And the Army says you recruit a soldier, but you retain a family. So we, the city of San Antonio, are great at recruiting businesses. We're great at incentivizing businesses. But what about the businesses that have been here, like Medwheels, for example, who've been hiring locally, training locally, not just changing our community, but transforming our community? Because when you take somebody off the street that otherwise will be on the public dole and you give them meaningful employment, like she's been doing for years, and not just Jane, others as well, JMP Paving that you are transforming our community and therefore our city. So let's help. Let's not be a hindrance. Arbitrary fines like JMP paving experience don't help. They don't help. Making up rules as we go along. Excluding people from meetings. I'm big about inclusion. But not the illusion of inclusion. Real inclusion. So we need more people in meetings. And I think I'm probably at my three minutes. Am I? Am I good? Oh, man. I'm a politician with more time. <laughs> so do you all see what I'm saying? This isn't rocket science. We're all here together. I think we all want the same thing. We really do. So when nobody's advocating, I hope, in here, because we all want the same thing. It's just that, and we love the city in its entirety. Of course, my focus is District 2. My focus is District 2, and I'll say that up front, and I don't think anybody's surprised about that. So let's, let's be more inclusive, not less inclusive. Let's make sure that in contracting that 
we represent everybody, Chief. That we should seriously endeavor to represent everybody. Have everybody at the table. That's what makes our city great. That's what makes our city unique. That's why businesses are clamoring to get here. That's why tourists are clamoring, clamoring to get here. That's why all of my relatives in Ohio want to spend their winters in my house. <laughs> because it's San Antonio, not just the weather. So let's make it a reality. Let's, let's live up to the legacy of San Antonio, Texas. That's what we can do that. We can do that. we got great leadership in this room. We can do that. Because companies... I, I love the big companies, don't get me wrong, but I admire the small, the med wheels of, of the city who just plug along. Let's make it easier. Help us out. If there's inventory that must be held on hand, let's make that clear. Help us get there. She'll do it. We'll do it. We'll, we want to work. We just want to work. We just want the city, to, the entire city to rise up. What's that old thing about a rising tide? My grandfather was a minister. He used to say it all the time. I never knew what he was talking about. Thank you so much. Thank you, uh, Councilman Tony. Um, your sentiments are well taken. Uh, in fact, as I came in uh, to this meeting this morning, I prayed for a long time, um, simply because uh, sometimes I think that uh, when there's any sign of protest that people think that it's uh, that someone's trying to hurt someone. It's, you should always do everything out of love. I appreciate the love that you shared uh, for what you have for our city, and hopefully in today's meeting we can continue that. Next, uh, we have uh, Ms. Rosie Baca uh, from the Fair Contracting Coalition. Hello, my name is Rosie Baca. Um, I'm from San Antonio, Texas, and the reason that I'm here to talk is about <coughs> baby, baby. I came here last year to have a meeting with the city for the city hearing on the behalf of J.P. Pavey, myself, Mr. Calvert, and Andrew Kovac, and we weren't allowed to go to the meeting. And I think we were discriminated because we shouldn't have been sent to another room, we should all met together. That's why I'm here. Because I want you guys to know what they did to us. Thank you, uh, Ms. Baca. Uh, we will address that later. Um, next, we'll have uh, the final citizen to be heard um, is the founder of the Fair Contracting Coalition and a person who is instrumental in helping to develop the city's uh, diversity action plan that was approved back when uh, Mayor Julian Castro was in office. Uh, he helped to recognize that we had disparity in contracting. And uh, a friend of the city, uh, also the person who uh, has led the uh, Fair Contracting Coalition's report card on public agencies, uh, Mr. T.C. Calvert. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and uh, thank you uh, to the SPAC committee members. First of all, let me commend you as volunteers, Mr. Gonzalez and Ms. Sokovita and Randy and uh, Sue Kang and the rest of this committee. You're kind of like we are. We're volunteers, and we're here to speak up for minority businesses. So I just want this SBAC committee to know that the Fair Contracting Coalition has your back. Uh, we have a, a great coalition of about 15 organizations, and the group is growing and growing. I won't take a whole three minutes. I'm going to be brief and to the point. Uh, I do want to raise the issue about the, first of all, let me commend the city for taking the fine. I understand that J.P. Paving, that the $16,000 fine, that it was uh, deleted. Is that cor correct, Fred? Yeah, it was resolved. Okay, it was resolved. Well, that was one of our issues, ladies and gentlemen. But let me tell you why, and we need to put it on the record. If you have other companies that are behind on their contract, just like J.P. Payton was behind, then you don't need to be finding them. It's not right. Especially when they hire 100 people from the community and they're providing beans and potatoes on the table. We don't need to do that. Let's be fair with everybody. Now, the other thing with the policy, the city, from what I understand, has no written policy when it comes to who can attend the meetings. I was highly pissed off <coughs> that Mr. Frisbee and his team, Hanzi or whatever his name is, in all due respect, denied us access to that meeting. We weren't there to be legal people. We were there to watch you and see how you conduct yourselves in those meetings toward these agencies. I pay taxes. And I should have a right to sit in those meetings. The other issue that we want to bring up to you is this. When Mayor Julian Castro 
was the mayor of this city. In 2012, when we first started the Fair Contracting Coalition, we asked that Asian Americans and African Americans be appointed to the Economic Development Foundation Board. Here we are, in 2019, still talking about this issue. And we ought to be ashamed. We ought to be ashamed. Because that's our tax dollars. These guys are spending millions of dollars with the Economic Development Foundation. That's why we don't have a lot of economic development in District 5. That's why we don't have a lot of economic development in District 2 in these low-income areas. Of course we'd like to see a Toyota in our neighborhoods. Of course we'd like to see a Seawall in our neighborhoods. I could be here all day long and tell you what goes on with the power structure in this town. We know more than you think we know about this issue with the Economic Development Foundation. And I'm going to say it, and I'm going to say it the way it is here today. I'm going to call it the way it is, and I'm going to step on some toes, and I'm going <coughs> to piss some people off, and I hope they get this on the record. Time, okay, this practicing institutional racism by the Economic Development Foundation Board. Thank you, Mr. Calvert. Um, so we're going to now uh, go into uh, our action items, and I want to say this. I appreciate each and every citizen for coming. Um, I uh, would also like to say uh, on the record that uh, many of these companies that spoke today uh, reached out to me prior to this meeting. Uh, what I have discovered, and I, I've shared with the SBAC members uh, also, is that there is a sentiment that uh, when they speak out uh, on these things that we call injustice, that they are that they are targets for what we call reprisal. That's right. And so I looked at the spirit of our Cebeda uh, ordinance, which is why we are here, which is why uh, we have the legitimacy of being here, and why we were appointed by various um, council members or mayors to be here. And that is, is because the affirmative action program of our city is a target. It's a bullseye. People don't like it when Michael Sinden says in a room that we've achieved 53% participation of small minority women-owned businesses in the city of San Antonio. They hate it. They don't like the commentary, Randy, that when we talked about when we first started this, when I first started this journey on this SBAC, I make no apologies to anybody who's new in here and who doesn't like for me to speak on what I'm speaking about. But I've been doing this since 2011. Eric Castro had the guts to appoint a <coughs> service-disabled veteran who happened to be black and, and in business to this uh, very committee. Every mayor that I've met with since then has the same problem, and that is, is that we still haven't figured out how to crack the nut on what we call institutional discrimination. If we did, then we wouldn't have the need for this meeting, and we wouldn't have a Cebeda ordinance. So I could be silent at any time I know. I know my appointment could be over tomorrow. I told you that this morning. So I can still come back to be a citizen to be heard. I still can protest with organizations in the streets and I can make it very difficult because I know where these skeletons are these skeletons that have been buried so we're going to talk about some of that today uh, again in love we're going to talk about it today so uh, thank you all for again for uh, voicing your concerns I think one part of uh, what I shared with some of our SBAC members is that there is no protection mechanism within our current Cebeda ordinance for a small minority woman-owned business that feels as though they've talked too much and now all of a sudden they're not getting the contracting opportunities from the city because they spoke up too much. I want this, uh, this uh, committee to think about uh, maybe establishing a subcommittee that addresses an executive session uh, issues that concern businesses that bring uh, their situations like you've heard this morning uh, to the surface. I think that uh, there needs to be some safeguards in place for these businesses. And I think that's something that's, that we can investigate as a committee with the city staff. So we'll move forward. The first action item is the approval of the February 8th minutes. And uh, those minutes were provided to you by our staff. You can correct me if I'm wrong, because Siegel knows a little more about this, but for anybody in this room who's a business who feels like they can't speak up against issues for fear of retaliation or fear of discrimination, 
the city has implemented a non-discrimination ordinance that's overseen by our Office of Equity. Yeah, our, our non-discrimination ordinance when provides for When these issues come up, there is an outlet for them to file. So I just want to make sure folks know that it's <coughs> Um, to take advantage of if they feel they've been discriminated against by right. someone at the city of San Antonio. Or, or actually in any other uh, private business as well. Right. You can file a complaint on any business and it's, uh, we'll make the determination whether our NBO actually applies to that business. So I think that was a good progressive <coughs> avenue that the city had taken in passing that. Okay, so um, and I don't know if we need to move this into uh, new business um, for the next agenda, but I'd like to see the appointment of the uh, chief equity officer to the SBAC committee to be at the meetings. Because these issues that, some of these issues that we're going to talk about today, I copied that equity office. And uh, I think that there's a, there's a blind spot where the equity office has never been in these meetings. And uh, so that solution and the non-discrimination ordinance, I understood those were solution sets. However, again, unless you have individuals who are policing uh, these issues and that they're here and that they're present, then we will never see uh, a fair and equitable process. And that's why we have to then make sure that then the equity officer is present. Uh, I know that it's a very important position. The position gets paid lots of money. I've read the job description over and over. In fact, I probably would qualify for that position myself because I have the background. Um, so we need to make sure that person's here because if that's going to be the check and balance, then we need to make sure that officer is here and represented. So that's a point we'll take. We can also make the note that, um, and, and again, maybe you need to guide us now. Uh, can we uh, assume in the future that that office will be here? Or does the SBAC have to be <coughs> Equity officer as a part of, of the future SBAC meeting. I will put them on standing meetings moving forward. And if a conflict arises like today where they couldn't attend for the late notice, um, it is our job as city as city employees to also notify that office if we hear of issues where discriminatory practices exist. So we will also pass it along in case they're not here. But we will summon them to the future meetings. And I'll add to that that uh, independent of, of this committee, that avenue to make the complaint is there. Uh, it's not subject to uh, first coming to any committee or requesting anyone's permission to follow. Okay, thank you so much. Mm -hmm. Yes, so now we'll go back to uh, the approval of the February 8th meeting minutes. Uh, were there any, uh, well, do I have a motion to have a approval? I've read through it. I don't have any changes. I need a motion to. Thank you, Randy. So it's been moved and it's been <coughs> seconded by Winita Um Are there any questions to the meeting minutes? All right. If not, uh, we'll take the vote. All in favor of approving the meeting minutes for February 8th, 2019. Uh, say aye. Aye. Uh, any opposed? Any abstentions? Okay, thank you. All right. So, motion, uh, so now we'll. I had uh, item number four, report, presentation, discussion, and the first one up is the San Antonio Economic Development Foundation. Um, so uh, is anybody from the EDF here? Uh, was the EDF invited? The EDF was invited. The EDF uh, declined to come. Why did they decline to come? Yeah, I know it, in your email you asked me to reply back with what their response was, so you can just read that sure. into the record here. So. We invited them back on <coughs> Tuesday, February 26th, and they replied back, um, Michael, I hope this email finds you well today. Please accept my apologies for a delayed response to your invitation below, because it came some time after. Unfortunately, I'm unavailable to participate in a meeting on March 22nd, but I'm pleased to report that I recently provided um, detailed briefings on EWDC to City Council a few weeks ago. <coughs> in response to Mr. Herring's request to assist you to get you know, come to the board, our executive committee has made progress in further diversifying its representation this past year and actively considering ways to engage additional chamber representation in our daily SADF activities. I'll be sure to have my staff provide updates along the way. Thanks for your continued support, Jenna. 
what's Jenna's position? Jenna is the CEO of the San Antonio Economic Development Fund. Thank you. Is that a question? When did they respond back to you? On March 19th, which was Tuesday evening. So I guess my question. Yes, please, Randy. <clears throat> my question is if you reached out to him on February 6th saying that we were going to have a meeting That's today. A sheet. That's a sheet. I'm sorry. Um, February 26th. February 26th. Um, there's, a, there's a great deal of time span between the request and the response. And the way I look at these meetings, even as a volunteer, is that if it's on my calendar, I need to be here. Unless there's something else that is more pressing such as a personal family matter. Um, I just, and I've always had this issue, I don't understand why somebody can't put it on the calendar, and if they can't show up, have somebody else assign it. <coughs> How large is the board of the EDF? It's over okay, five people. I don't know. And they, they have a, a, a significant board, and so no one from that organization could attend. Correct. Um, I also asked for copies of their uh, IRS Form 990s. Did they provide those today? Uh, Chris, you made that request on Wednesday, I believe. I apologize. That request will go out to them today. Okay, so the IRS Form 990 is, is, is what every nonprofit organization provides. Um, in their 990, because I reviewed it, they are listed as a classified as a Chamber of Commerce. We've had the issue of Chamber of Commerce and, and who gets what in this equity issue. Um, how much money is the city providing to various Chambers of Commerce? If the EDF is a large Chamber of Commerce and it receives public taxpayer dollars from the City of San Antonio, Bear County, CPS, who are all board participants, and I believe, because again, I wanted to see the 990 and I wanted to be entered into record factually. <coughs> anyone to say I'm, I'm, I'm spreading uh, falsehoods about the EDF, but more than half of their dollars that they use for their budget here comes from public dollars. Is that correct? I believe that's correct. That is correct. I, I don't know. It is yeah, correct. We, we should say it. Yeah, no, I, list, I, I validated it already. It okay. is correct. And, and, and the EDFs did validate that because Councilman Hall had a meeting with the EDF and, uh, and uh, actually uh, Mr. Dominguez, the uh, director of this department, and my follow-up meeting with Councilman Hall indicated that the EDF does receive more than half of its funds from public dollars. With that being said, and that's a, again why I asked for the 990, not to have, not to have a legal argument, but to, to clarify on the record that the City of San Antonio has a monetary relationship with the EDF. And so when the citizens asked for the EDF to appear today, and they chose not to, it's not the first time that they've been requested to um, provide more information and background. Today wasn't going to be a lynching for the EDF. If they had shown up, we would have been very polite, courteous, and we'd be able to hear what they had to say about how they were going to move the organization forward. But they've never given me the opportunity to uh, hear their change that they provided uh, to the board. Now, the only thing that I can say that I, visibly that I saw on the EDF's website were changes of new past chairs of three chambers of commerce, namely the San Antonio Chamber of Commerce, the Hispanic Chamber of Commerce, and the North Chamber of Commerce. Those are the three chambers that have had the relationship with the EDF, where they swap money, and those chambers have been also recipients of city dollars to the city manager's office. So again, when we talk about this issue of chambers, fairness, equity, equality and all that stuff, I'm, I'm pointing out again that there's a problem. I came in today and I looked at this, this portfolio of leaders in San Antonio. <coughs> now, I thumbed through it to see, and then they had a little section on the international, global aspects of who are the leaders in San Antonio. And uh, ladies and gentlemen, I didn't see one African American in this feature. I did see the director of our department here. I did see the EDF. I did see a lot of people who have been pushed as being our leadership of the city, but I did not see not one African American that could be spoken of, and so I asked the question, well, why? I mean, in our narrative as a city, is our department's not saying and pointing out other examples of, of who's doing 
things in this city, advancing small minority businesses. I'm saddened when I see, again, it's just not the EDF. It's everything that we do as a culture of our city. The seventh largest city, San Antonio, is on the what? The list of the most segregated, economically, economically segregated cities in America. It starts with organizations like the EDF. It's a shame that they couldn't be here today. Because they're not doing what taxpayers expect to do with our money. Everybody say our money. Our our money. money. It's our money. I got that from you, Mr. Cup. <laughs> it's our money. Yeah. It's not their money. I know they may not want to travel with some of us. And Jim Crow shouldn't be practiced in this city. That's why I said I can be very short-lived on this committee, and I don't care. Because Jim Crow should not be practiced in 2019. More than $600,000 of taxpayer dollars goes to the EDF. And yet they can't show up for a meeting. So what did you have to say about the EDF? No, not about the EDF. Just some clarification on the 990. So the 990, there's... Um, Several organizations, well, organizations that are required to file on 990. The Chamber of Commerce is just one of them. So because they file on 990, it doesn't necessarily mean that they are Chamber of Commerce. They could absolutely be. I just wanted to put that. Thank you. And yeah. we will still reach out and request that form today, Chris. Well, I, I think that uh, the SBAC does have an opportunity to make some change in this conversation. Because it's not just simply um, whether or not they showed up to this meeting. Since uh, Mr. Calvert's report since uh, 2011, <coughs> he has been asking the same question about the integration of the Economic Development Foundation. I did meet with the Economic Development Foundation, and I gave them this presentation called Integrate the Executive Committee of the SAEDF. I went through their website, I pointed out that not only on the board, but on their paid staff, there's not one African American um, not on the hired staff. Uh, they do have a woman from the West Indies, uh, but again, I said African American, uh, that was from the community, not one. Uh, yes, you may say Paula Gold Williams is on the EDF board. She doesn't represent business, she represents energy. Paula Gold Williams, while I love her, she can't tell me as a small minority business owner how to manage my business or what our business community should be doing. To my knowledge, she's not a part of the Alamo City Black Chamber, the African American Chamber. And so again, I'm just looking at these little instances and I'm saying we're being shut out. And the excuse is, is that, well, you know, we have a plan. That's what they told me. I said, Look for the changes. And actually, I'm going to give you all the letter that Bear County, the executive director for their EDD, gave me. So that way, y'all ain't thinking I'm tripping. Okay? Because we talk about, well, I, I, I want you to leave with facts. I want you to leave here thinking Karen is tripping. So if, if, my, if David Marquez can write, Dear Jenna, I was copied on Mr. Christopher Herring's recent emails to you seeking a face-to-face -face opportunity to discuss his concerns regarding the ethics composition of the San Antonio Economic Development Foundation. This was dated July 17th of last year. The county, oh, he specifically wants to identify a solution for the persistent lack of African-American and Asian-American private sector business representation on the EDF Executive Committee. The county is committed to ensuring all aspects of diversity and inclusion. We strongly encourage you to address Mr. Herring's request by identifying and recruiting for inclusion to the SAEDF Executive Committee qualified successful business persons from the African American and Asian business communities. Mr. Herring has some concrete ideas about how to best proceed. Please work to meet with him as soon as possible and give me a report on your proposed plan of action. Sign David Marquez, Executive Director. Now, David is on the EDF's board. Traditionally, our city manager has been on the board. Has our new city manager taken the position on the board, or is this new city manager not on the board as of yet? 
I don't know whether they've taken the position, but the position itself is uh, it's official, so by being city manager, it's not, it wasn't the individual who was appointed, it was the position of city manager. Now, I don't know whether Mr. Walsh has actually attended a meeting yet, but he is a member of that board when he took the office of city manager. Okay, thank you for the clarification. So with that being said, we have our city staff that is on the SAEDF. That being said, we spend millions of dollars to support the activities of the SAEDF. That being said, uh, we have an opportunity to communicate our recommendation to the city manager because he is on the board representing us in those interests, right? What is the pleasure of the board? What questions do you have? Should, should we have, when the EDF um, attends our meeting, should we have the city manager, Mr. Walsh, be here as well? It's a great suggestion. Or a representation. Or representation, somebody. I, I, I like the initial suggestion because the new city manager is the new city manager. To have representation doesn't mean the message gets always communicated in the way and manner it should. We've been dealing so long with this. Um, I tell you, and you tell Michael, and he tell. So let's have the city manager to be invited uh, to the uh, discussion about the SAEDF with the EDF president. I think that would be helpful. Is that, is that your recommendation? That is. Okay. So is that a motion? Okay, so it's the motion probably second. Any other questions on that motion? Okay. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? Any abstentions? Okay, so let the record reflect that uh, the entire uh, SBAC uh, approved that motion. And one thing, I think, Chris, you have a meeting with Eric and Renee next week to discuss this issue, correct? Yes. Okay. So just want to make it clear they've set up some time to meet with Chris prior to this meeting to meet with them on this issue. Okay. Is that open to the entire rest <coughs> Um, I don't... I, you know, if, if the SBAC wanted to reach out to the city manager to attend this meeting, I think that would be more popular than having to make sure that that was called. Now, and Mr. Herring, I don't know what the capacity you requested that meeting, whether it was as SBAC chair or whether it was in your individual capacity, or uh, so, so, so let the record the so, so, well. so let the record uh, reflect that I didn't ask for the meeting with the city manager. He asked yes. for the meeting with me. Did he, uh, so to be qualified and qualify me as being the chair of the SBAC or as the executive director of Global Chamber or as the past chair of the Texas Association for African American Chambers of Commerce or as the past chair for the Diversity Action Plan of the City of San Antonio Subcommittee. I can't tell you, but I can tell you, or even as a founding member of the Fair Contracting Coalition, I can't tell you why he wanted to meet with me, but I can tell you that that is a very important meeting to where we're going to advance these issues that we're talking about. Well, we can ask in more capacity and get yeah. that clarification. But the point being that if it's a meeting with the SBAC, then maybe it might be more appropriate for the city manager all of you at an at a open meeting, uh, or, you know, one of the can. And this, you know, ask Chair, and then you can tell them about this request of this meeting here, and you would do it. As, you know, as Chair can tell them what the hope was, and tell them these requests of the next time. I can do that. And, and, you know, even with all the correspondence that I've been sending about the San Antonio Economic Development Foundation, the city manager has been copied on everything. So it's not like uh, this is a conversation that's hidden. This is a very public uh, conversation. Again, I'm, I'm very sad to say that, you know, we live in the seventh largest city and we still have to deal with what, what is termed as institutional discrimination. Um, say, how do you say that? Because, well, I was the chief uh, military equal opportunity officer for the Air Force uh, at Andrews Air Force Base. I was President Bill Clinton's uh, White House chairman for his uh, One America uh, initiative um, race for the Department of Defense. So I know what institutional discrimination is. I called it. I'm calling it. I'm calling what was happening a foul. 
this is what it is. Yes, Randy. I make a motion that since we have members of the public here, that we move on with some of the new items because all of this is uh, part of that. Very good. All right. Well, does any other uh, member of the uh, uh, SBAC have any more comments on this one issue? If not, then we can certainly move forward. I'll take your suggestion of being a friendly uh, say that let's conserve our time. Okay, thanks. All right, so next item uh, on the agenda is to discuss the MedWheels follow up on uh, uh, SA Fire Department contract with MedWheels. So, who's going to present the uh, background on that? Chief? I can give that information to this one. Um, good morning to you, Mr. Herring, and the rest of the board. My name is Carl Weeders. I'm a deputy chief with the San Antonio Fire Department. Um, the Medwell's contract uh, we've been at uh, some time, uh, and I can say that at this point, uh, with what I consider to be great success, um, we have uh, gone through some inventory issues. Um, that we have resolved, although not contractually obligated to do so, uh, we have done that. Um, and I think, as Ms. Gonzalez said, uh, there were great lessons to be learned for all. Um, you know, our transition from dealing on this contract with what was a manufacturer or a national supplier to a local business, um, there is a difference. Uh, prior to that, the, the, uh, when we did that out, the, the quantities that we required to be in stock for 90 days were not quite as important. A larger company, it didn't matter. They stock a lot of, of items, uh, and we didn't take, unfortunately, didn't take a lot of care in really looking at those numbers closely. The other part that happens is that our, our the way that we do business on the EMS side of the house, uh, it changes periodically. Uh, we find uh, new ways of doing things. Uh, we get feedback from our guys in the field, uh, and we have to have that communicated on through the uh, down to the procurement process as well too. So I think we've seen some of those things that we are uh, in, the, in the process of, um, of uh, correcting or doing better. Um, I think that as we move forward, we certainly, and, and since I was talking about the medical supply contract that will be coming up in a few months, um, we as a department have uh, broken that down into uh, multiple separate divisions uh, to make it easier for that. And then of course the purchasing department takes that and moves forward with uh, whatever process that will be used for uh, procurement of that. Uh, but what we are doing with it is we're taking more care um, to have the, uh, the background and the data to establish the quantities that are required to be on hand uh, to make sure that we don't have an issue like we had before. Uh, at this point, I can report that I, I, as of our last meeting, uh, we have um, uh, taken care of all those issues. Um, and I think as we move forward, uh, we should see uh, very little, if any, issues with this because we have corrected those. Um, as far as the, the uh, MedWheels performance, I can't say enough about that. They've done a great job uh, <coughs> in providing uh, what we need uh, on a daily basis. Uh, and as she said as well, too, you know, one of the things I think that uh, over the years as we have begun this level of transformation of that, one of the positives that I see in certainly in dealing with local, uh, is in fact that. They are right here. They're in our backyard. Uh, they are required to keep a local stock, which is a 90-day supply for us. And that is on top of the stock that we carry as well, too. In our business, um, bad things can happen. And when they do, it's all hands on deck. Um, to have that additional supply of medical locally is a good thing for us. Mm -hmm. Uh, and we do, and it, it's kind of fit into, at least my philosophy, uh, is that when we deal with vendors um, as a department, it's not a vendor-customer relationship. It's a partnership. And I think it feeds well into what's going on here as well, too. When you look at a true partnership, the way I look at it is if my vendor succeeds, then I succeed. And I'm here to do whatever it takes uh, to, to have the vendor succeed. Not to make things more difficult for them, uh, but to, to do everything that I can uh, to ensure that they succeed, because when they succeed, I succeed. And the community does as well, too. Uh, and in a business that I'm in, where we're talking about lives, uh, it's very critical. 
so uh, as, a, as a department, that's what we always protect. Um, I'd like to say I, I think that it's just, it, it lends itself, this whole, the whole uh, local small business piece uh, lends itself to that level of, of uh, hands-on uh, type uh, approach where, uh, you know, in the past we've, we have dealt with some uh, larger companies where uh, I just dealt with dealing with one right now, a local company, where we couldn't even get the name of the president because we were having some problems. Uh, we ended up with a, a regional rep that I'd already dealt with. Um, and uh, it's it's in the past where we've dealt with companies that the, that the owner is accessible. It makes it a lot easier on us to be able to pick up the phone and call the owner, say, i got a problem, and it gets taken care of, as opposed to the more corporate that we deal with where it takes time and there's a lot of layers between us and that person that can solve the problem. So um, I, I would think that uh, in terms of the program utilized here, I, I would call uh, this particular contract a success. Uh, and it has been a learning process. Uh, for all. I know Mr. Heron was in a previous meeting where we were discussing the, the uh, getting through some of those uh, inventory issues. And, and uh, I think all parties have been very willing to work with. Uh, and it's just been a, it's been a good good process. Does anybody from the SBAC have a question? I guess my question would be, um, <clears throat> Ms. Gonzalez, do you concur with what we just heard? Do you um, feel it's a success? <coughs> I, I, I definitely think that we're moving forward. We are keeping it positive. Okay. Uh, at this point, I would not say it's a success. I would say that it's definitely a work in progress. And let me explain the reason why I'm saying this. Mm -hmm. And again, it's a lesson to be learned. And the reason that I came public about this, many of you know that I'm branded for local community. Many of you know that I've been a champion, along with everybody in here, to try to create equity, not disparity, for local companies. When that contract was solicited, and if you were to equate the volume by line item at the price of that contract, the value of that contract was $886,000. Medwills received a 90-day supply that came directly from the incumbent, who happened to be Zoll, <coughs> telling procurement the volumes that they have been buying to meet the supplies. We got that 90-day supply, and 50% of that 90-day supply was not purchased. So that, that's the lesson that, that the chief and I are going through. So today, when you look at the value of that contract, and I think it's something that we need to explore, if some of these line items have been replaced by a different product, instead of that line item being afforded an opportunity for Medwills to bid it, I didn't. That line item went to the prime contractor uh, that is located out of Indiana. So I think that's an issue that we need to start looking. Again, it's part of the lessons learned. What kind of language are we going to put in contracts going into the future? That if there's going to be replacement parts, is the company that currently holds the contract have the opportunity, the first opportunity, to bid on that and not send it to another contract? So that now that the chief and I have been working very well, and I have to commend the chief because he's so busy he has sat down with Midwest numerous times, and as part of the collaboration, that's part of the partnership, that's part of creating that success. But that contract value today is probably less than 50%. So that the value currently, as we've gone back and modified the volumes, I'll give you an example. Um, we have non-invasive blood pressure cuffs. If you ever see an EMS technician, our, our fire department, they have that defibrillator, that's called a 12-lead defibrillator. Mm -hmm. Well, that defibrillator has all these different supplies. You have cables, you have blood pressure cuffs, capital lines, filter lines, sensors, and they get replaced. So every time they get used, you need to replace it. So one of the products that we work through is the uh, Soft 09 2MQs. The volume that I have was 125. Um, but that volume is one of the volumes that we have to adjust 
So the city purchased 50 out of that 125, and I'm still holding 75. So that now I, I need it, now it's going to give me an opportunity. See, if this is the opportunity the city has given me is that we have all the adjoining cities, Shorts, you know, um, Alamo Heights. So now I am going to see if I can expand my customer base by reaching out to everybody else. Okay, I'd like to get the yes back to have some further questions. Okay. So, Mr. Uh, Roland, our, our attorney. <laughs> Ms. Gonzalez, I, I appreciate your input and, of course, uh, understand the issue from, I think it was March of 2017 when this issue first came to everyone's attention. I, I got a little bit lost in how the question. Uh, can you explain again the, the, the issue with the 886 number? Was it that that number was uh, inflated or that it became different when it was broken apart? I, I got lost during that explanation. If you could so so if, if, if you were to look at this contract, you've got different line items. I, maybe we've got about 25 line items. There's about 20 different model numbers. Those model numbers had quantities when the solicitation came out. And then we got the pricing against those quantities. So when you added the pricing times the quantities, the total value of that would have been $886,000. And then due to... Um between the contract period when the contract was with the old company, the large the old company, and transitioning to Medwheels, the fire department, uh, of course, secured inventory that would satisfy their needs, but uh, which then caused there not to be the demand to uh, spend with uh, Medwheels. So <coughs> that what created that gap and maybe even some of the line items not necessarily being used now because there was uh, other uh, technologies in which the department wanted to use. So, um, so that's where that opportunity, you know, with that contract that we all celebrated uh, has. But we also know that, and I'd like the chief to talk about this new contract because we. And I'm going to give you that. But I, I want the chief to talk about this new medical supply contract. I think it's about $12 million of contract that's, that that I even spoke on that with the finance department about not putting it out so that the big zoles of the world can get that, but to uh, to debundle it. And then um, and then so also I've been talking with this, uh, uh, the city staff about uh, if there's going to be, say, if there's four ways in which they're going to do this $12 million or, you know, then perhaps one of those uh, methods that we can explore is to have a buy board uh, option that targets small minority women businesses that are on buy boards, so that we can we can actually see the fulfillment of growing to scale a company that has really lost money in this initial deal, and then make it right by giving them a contract that they can fulfill. And that's the letter that uh, Ms. Gonzalez gave to the uh, to the SBA. So, yes. so quick follow. I'm sorry. Quick follow on my original question. So what was the delta between the 886 and the, and the new contract value then? Um, we have dramatically decreased the volume. Dramatically. Um, but you tried to go back to the manufacturers to take the volume back, and they said no. So you ate, you ate inventory. Uh, that would say partially true statement, yes. So the volumes today, we've, we've modified the volumes. They have probably decreased more than 50%. So from the original volumes that were anticipated on this contract, now that we're realigning uh, the volumes, there it's less than 50%. I would venture to say it's more like 40%. So if I understand what you're saying, correct me if I'm wrong, but if, if Zoll had received the contract, it would have been worth 886 local provider gets the contract is 443 thereabouts. Is that, is that a fair show? No. The no, same no. issues would have applied to the other I see. Okay. That makes sense. Okay. Now, so now the, only, the only difference in the two, and that's what I was pointing out earlier, is that before, when we're dealing with a national vendor, mm -hmm. those stock amounts didn't matter. I see. They, they sell to everybody. So mm -hmm. it was really a non-factor for us. What I'm saying is that as we move forward, not just us, but any other contract, is that care be taken in those kind of numbers. So the way the city operates is, even at that, we don't, we give an estimated amount of the contract annually in a, in a contract. 
that doesn't mean we are guaranteeing that amount. It could be half of that amount. It could be okay. whatever. We right. try to be as close as we can with it. So what we did in, in this particular case is we procured from them greater than 90 days stock in order to reduce the stock levels over there and then realign them uh, so that the, the vendor was not out for the most part. That. So we, we purchased, in, in some cases, maybe three years worth of stock uh, because it was off that much. Another thing that goes into this that makes this one unique is that we, uh, I think it was about three years ago, is when we went to this particular model. But this model came all new accessories as well too. So uh, our history of buying was probably based more on a projection of not having to use that particular unit. When you talk about taking blood pressures, uh, this unit will do that. However, our medics also carry in their box the old manual way of doing that, and it's up to them to decide what they do. Once we get a piece of equipment, we may anticipate that they're going to be using that blood pressure monitor on that unit, when in fact, they don't. They may prefer to put the blood pressure cup on themselves and do it themselves. So that's the other kind of variable that we deal with. So what we've done to try to get through that as well, too, is that we, uh, we started out with setting up quarterly meetings. And in the last meeting, Ms. Gonzalez said we probably don't need to meet face to face, but what we're doing is we're tracking those items that are on that contract uh, from a usage standpoint. And we're looking at those uh, really constantly, but on a quarterly basis, we're providing those numbers to Ms. Gonzalez as well, too, so that we can look at what we're doing. So if we see a downturn in using a particular item, uh, we will look at why that is and then try to make an adjustment at that point uh, in terms of stock. And that can go up or down. Our guys can start using more blood pressure cuffs, and that number could, could rise on any of those items as well, too. So um, that's kind of the background piece of that and, and how we got there and how we're trying to, um, like I say, I, from what we did before, we, we had to do none of that with a vendor. That's why I say, in my opinion, it's very successful, because I think the things that we have addressed, we have addressed successfully, uh, and we continue to work on those and make sure that this, this contract uh, is successful for all. Thank you so much. Well, you, uh, I want to let uh, our vice chair do that. Sure. Well, let me just very quickly. Very very good. Good. I appreciate your effort, Mr. Calvert's effort in raising these issues and bringing awareness to these issues in the community, as well as I appreciate the chief's effort in, in making this a reductive part of the community. Ms. Gonzalez, I just wanted to backtrack a little bit. You said that a contract went to a company in Indiana. Can you kind of elaborate on that? Well, currently, Currently, um, the medical supplies contract um, is worth roughly about $12 million. Um, last year, uh, the final year of this contract, uh, there was an effort by the city of San Antonio not to issue the final year. Concordance Health Solutions uh, is out of Indiana. And they, they, the city wanted to debundle it. This is the effort for SBAC, and I really want to commend all the work that you guys are doing because it's making a difference. So that it was solicited, but the way and the manner that it was solicited was going to be highly disadvantageous to the local swimmers. Because one thing that I want to share with you, my experience going through that debundling, <coughs> is that a lot of these prime companies do not really have the vested interest of a swing. I was very disappointed when I walked into a meeting that Chris Bird touched on it, that there is favoritism in this town. There is, you know, certain um, favorites that, that, that might take more of a priority than others. So that the way that the um, contract was solicited was going to be disadvantageous and so from the efforts of SBAC making a recommendation to finance not to reissue that contract, not, not, not to award that contract because we need to do work. And it's very important right now for everybody to be engaged because this contract before it comes out we really need to start having a conversation that a local company can either do it as a prime, not that the big companies are going to bring in a company just to use it as a pass-through, because I've seen that happen already 
So that that's that hopefully answered your question. Thank you. I thought we had. Thank you very much. Yes, I appreciate. So remember when you the way the city issues bids, there's really two primary ways, and there's really one primary way in Jane's case. And those are typically done through low bid fashions. So we cannot restrict a bid to a local small minority owned business. You cannot do set asides. Okay. But what you do, so, so in her case, when that solicitation was let out, there was a low bid process, and all the all finance and buyers do in selecting the lowest bidder. Now, what we do is, in ways it was successful, and we're learning lessons, it wasn't as successful as we wanted it. Jane brought this issue to you all maybe five, six years ago to debundle it. It has now been debundled into three solicitations, of which in those three solicitations, you can even bid on different line items, so it can almost be debundled in other five ways. It was also the first time we were allowed to place subcontracting goals on there, which, of course, prime is ideal, 100%, but we still see that as a success because it still drives utilization in areas where we had never had it. And so we're looking at this contract again in the best method to spur small minority mode business utilization and coordination with five. <coughs> Can you read the uh, suggestion that I just gave you in regards to uh, the future contract? Sure. So uh, I, I received this from Chris. He says, I think we should exercise the option of having a buy board program to benefit small minority women-owned businesses to further success of the Sabata program. In regards to the anticipated medical supply contracts in the city of San Antonio, we can use buy boards as a tool as we have other tools in the economic development department toolbox. I propose to keep in line with the fire chief's expressed desires to have a local swimming company with warehousing capability, with best value, one that holds current inventory, and is at past performance delivering a 90 day supply. So that's kind of how I, you know, been just after going to countless number of meetings with, with Ms. Gonzalez. And, you know, as the SBAC chair, I've been going to a number of meetings with any company who asks just because I feel like that's, that's a part of what I'm supposed to do, um, despite my family saying I get paid for none of this nonsense. Uh, but the truth is, it's, it's sacrificial. So that's a solution set that I'd like the department to consider. Um, we'll enter it into the formal uh, record that that's a, uh, my recommendation. It may not be the board's recommendation, but that's what I'm offering as one way to uh, keep uh, our, our, our city <laughs> safe, our fire chief happy, and um, our uh, small minority women owned businesses uh, moving forward. So, with that said, um, unless there's anyone else from yes, uh, a question. Sutain. I have a question. So, on the buy board, does that mean Jane currently is listed as one of the vendors? Well, you know, if you look at the wording, uh, I'm not I'm not saying uh, med wheels in that, that proposal. In general, what okay. I'm saying is, is that oh, just, um, buy boards in general, the city does use buy boards yes. for. Um, specialty items, sure. trucks that are specialized, right? We, we have a practice. Before mm -hmm. 2011, when we were at, what, 13% um, participation of small minority women-owned businesses, <coughs> and it was a horrible process that we've improved 53% at this point, buy boards was the way that they would do this. So, so I'm focused on the fact that while buy boards was the way in which we did this business under the city, we did have a focus on looking at those buy boards that have a cluster of small minority women-owned businesses that could benefit by having um, the direct opportunity to be scaled up within our city. We talked about second stage companies. So second stage companies is something that I really want the city and, and, and SBAC to know more about because it's it's we don't have many tools to help those businesses that have been in the trenches for 10 years and that want to expand. And, and, and so that was why the EDF piece was important. I mean, heck, we're going out with taxpayer dollars going all around the world to, to have companies that come here, but yet we can't scale up your company here because all of our investment is talking about how we can bring people in outside to uh, make San Antonio better. I believe the heart and soul of our city is to improve the businesses that we have. We have 36,000 small minority women-owned businesses. We know this. We need tools desperately. My board may be a tool. We have to explore it. Our city needs to give us what more can we do. And so we can't treat this opportunity as we just look at the A, B, and C of what's in that Sabeta, because we know better. In other cities, Jane, you have a buy board contract in Austin. Um, is that correct? So 
other cities are tapping into our resource. So why won't our city let us, you know, have some of the same ways? Because some of you have excellent companies that deserve focused attention right now. It's random when we go to a uh, lowest bid. Let's look at best value for some of these things because it's important. All right. Anything else? But I do want you to know, 540 is not easy to get in. And so why isn't it easy to get in? Tell the group. You have to, uh, how do you say, you need to have a team of time to, to apply and, and, and bid on the contract. I'm sure Jane can explain to you if she does have that. And, and, I, 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 and we're not going to go back to Jane. Yeah, it's but, okay. But I'm, I'm, but I'm saying, I asked that question yes. because those companies <coughs> that do take the time, that, that are excellent, I mean, they put rigor into it. They put, and so when our businesses do that, that means that they have the ability to be scaled even further, because um, they're they're I sacrificing to get on those boards. You know how hard it is. Yeah, I agree with you. Yeah, I just so think we need to we're talking about. Yeah. We don't have to have the traditional low value. <laughs> As a city, we've hosted workshops and we've been trying to partner with other governmental agencies. Like I think Ross Mitchell at Alma College did one on how to get on co-ops and better educate that process to the community. That's right. I think we need to explore that so everybody knows how to get into the So, would you like to use that as a motion to have five boards well, to be a part of the next um, uh, SBAC meeting or a future SBAC meeting agenda? Super. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Sure. I think we need to. Uh, I agree. We can. You know, we should explore and uh, maybe educate some small business or local business that interested <coughs> and go to the next level. Second. I need a second. second. I second. Okay, so let's move power second. Any uh, other discussion on the issue for adding this item to the next agenda? All in favor, so about saying aye. 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 Any opposed? Any abstentions? Okay, so now we're going to move on to item number uh, letter C review of the TCI job order contract process. Uh, do you have a perfect? Okay, can you all hear me okay? Okay, good. So I'm going to try to keep this fairly short and sweet. Um, I know most of you, but my name is Kelsey Young, and I lead the contracts division for um, transportation capital improvements. And we oversee. Is it better if I'm over here? And we um, solicit and oversee all the construction and construction-related contracts for the city, with the exception of those who are out on the airport runway. So um, just to give you a little bit of a background too. On average, we solicit about 100 um, solicitations per year, and we award on average around 150. So that also includes our JOC program and also our task order program. Okay, so what is a job order contract? It's used for um, renovations and repairs of vertical projects. Um, we competitively procure it with one solicitation, and without having all of the projects defined, we have an idea of some of them, but also multiple projects will come up. And we use the RFCSP process, which allows for um, us to look at qualifications, past experience, pro um, understanding of the JSC, including everybody submitting on the same sample project. And then we also are able to add 20 beta points to this solicitation. So we have been authorized by Section 2269 of the Government Code. And by law, these contracts may be a maximum of five years, two years base, three years extensions. And our average size um, that we use for our projects are about $40,000. Anything that's over $100,000 has to go back to council for approval for <coughs> And then the JSC task orders have a similar cycle to all of our projects, just on a smaller scale. And as we mentioned, we have this available for all city departments to use, and most of them do, um, and especially for any type of common projects, and then also in anything really urgent, like a roof repair or plumbing repairs or something that we really can't wait for the solicitation process. So, how are JSCs managed and used? We end up with a pool of, solicit of respondents. I'll go into that a little bit further. And then a project is identified either by TCI or by a client department. And then they coordinate typically with TCI. And a 
JOC is selected for that particular project by a variety of reasons, such as the JOC's current workload or the familiarity and ex expertise with that type of work, as well as having any additional sort of security requirements or something like, for example, if it's out at the airport, there's certain badging that sometimes is needed. Then the JOC has the option of whether or not they want to ex accept that project, or if they want to decline it, they have too much other stuff going on, or they don't feel like that's the project they want to work on. Um, but if they do accept it, then they respond with price, <coughs> schedule, product samples, submittal, et cetera. Then after that, both the client department and the JOC have an opportunity to negotiate a little bit if needed. And then after everybody has mutually approved of the particular task order, then the project commences. They meet if needed for pre-con, um, review plans and specs, answer any questions, and so on. So, in, we have been doing these JSCs for a while now. Um, the last JSC program was done in 2015, and we had pretty good utilization. Ten JSCs were awarded, and um, we had eight small businesses, six minority-owned businesses, three women-owned businesses, and one African-American-owned business. Subcontracting goal was 24% and 3% AABE for 24% <coughs> MWE, excuse me. And we have paid out about $52 million on that contract so far. And of that, a um, little over $38 million went to Sebeda Certified. Almost $30 million went to MWE. <coughs> certified, and almost four million went to AABE certified. So <coughs> we're pretty happy with the way that this contract worked out. How many more slides do you um, I have okay. just a couple more. So this year on February 21st, um, 10 GSTs were again awarded by council. We have the breakdowns actually even a little bit better, where we have eight small businesses again, but seven of them are minority-owned businesses. Two women-owned businesses and one African-American-owned business. We've also increased the subcontracting goal. It's still the same of 24% of MWBE, but we have increased it to 4% AABE. Last time we um, exceeded our amount for AABE subcontracting, and we believe that we'll do the same this year. Question for you before you go. Mm -hmm. um, so, City Council, um, I addressed the question about whether or not the city was meeting its aspirational goals in respect to uh, the prime and the subcontracting. Can you address that, please? Because when you say that we've been successful, I want you to put that in perspective of the aspirational goals that has been shown in the Sabeta uh, study, disparity study. Because y'all made me look like I was a liar. Um, on a city council meeting. You did. The department did. And so I want you to clarify whether or not we've been ever successful with reaching African American construction goals with TCI. So I'll, I'll answer that one, Kelsey. So um, at an overall level, uh, it is positive to report that it was the first year the city exceeded its aspirational goal for African American owned businesses 3.1% utilization to 2.8% availability. However, in the construction industry, we were a hair deficient um, at 1.8% utilization to 1.9% availability. I just will note that while deficient, this was our best year ever. It was almost double the previous year. So it shows that the tools we're putting in place and what was amended in the 2016 pro uh, program is in fact progressing and we're having year over year improvements. So while we have to continue to strive to meet that, um, we are seeing increases of where we are deficient. And also just to clarify on me, this is one solicitation that I'm talking about. You know, it's 10 contracts, so 2000, well actually two solicitations, 2015 and then our current 2019. So it's 10 contracts, but it's just, it's um, 10 out of 150. So there's definitely areas where we can improve. How, how many of the, uh, the 2019 contracts that were selected out of the 10 there were selected in the previous uh, previously awarded contracts? Um, I believe it was seven. Uh, I, yeah, we have to go back and look. I didn't yes, we can, we can verify that. 
Um, the councilwoman, there was a councilwoman at City uh, uh, that asked the question of how do you assign uh, work? Which council member was that? Was that Sandoval? She asked I think question. it was Sandoval, I don't remember, but I recollect. Yeah, so, and, and I think that that, uh, that question she asked, I'd like to have you come back at the next meeting to address that because I didn't find that that, that response that the director gave was really clear to how y'all decide that the work and whether the work, when the work comes, if it's equitable distribution of it and so forth because we have received complaints that the work uh, has not been equally uh, distributed. And, and that was something that came out, but okay, continue. Well, and that's one of the things that we are going over in here, but we can go into that in more detail. Okay, so. And, and, and on this one, who was on the, uh, the board that determined who was awarding, who was going to be awarded these contracts? Because the composition of the board is the question that I have. Who was on the the evaluation committee? That's correct. The evaluation. Okay, so the evaluation committee, first of all, please know it's not a formal board. It is an evaluation committee who was brought together based on um, subject matter expertise and so on. And it was a combination of the city manager's office, TCI, um, building and equipment services, and the parks departments. Okay, so, so that's was the director of TCI yeah. on that, uh, that contract? I believe he was. Um, Robbie Lucini was on that. Okay, he so is now our interim director. He was not at the time. Okay, so so I guess my question is, is um, uh, I, I, I also said something to the effect that the process wasn't fair. And our mayor, I you know, I respect. He said that he told the black contractor that the process was fair. I'm trying to understand <coughs> um, where. If the city manager's office is the top office in our staff is on the, the evaluation of the board, and you have the TCI director and its department on there, and then other departments, how does someone say that a process isn't fair and get someone who is outside of that process to be able to say that process wasn't fair? I, I, and I was in the Air Force for 20 years, and we always had an appeal authority. So when you put city manager office on there, that's the highest level of appeal. So how, how, how do we rectify the situation when the process doesn't have uh, any type of real appeal authority once you, once you have the manager and the department determining who they want to pick? And so I would add to that that while the evaluation committee makes the recommendation, it is the city council who approves that contract. Okay, good. So, City Council, this went to the High uh, Audit Committee. High Profile High Audit. High Profile Audit, yes. right, because of the value of the contract. And then, so, uh, again, the council member, I think it was either Courage or Perry, said, you know, we didn't have anyone from the community that came before us to talk about this contract. And I've been sitting here, and we as an SBAC asked to be very much informed on the agenda items that, that go before the High Audit Committee. So, I took that as a blow because I couldn't respond. It was a council member basically chastising the audience for not going to his meeting. And then I know that there's two citizens appointed to that uh, that audit committee, and they're not members of the SBAC, so there's really no continuity between what we discuss here and what that audit committee receives. So how do we change that? Because so, Chairman, um, I'll add to that that um, those meetings are posted online. So those meetings happen every third. Week. We requested. We requested for the department. You know what, you're, you're, you're right. I'm not looking to, to find more work for these volunteers. Okay. Uh, you're right. If it's a suggestion made, then you know we'll, we'll look at it on the staff level. But again, those meetings, are, all of those meetings, are public meetings and are frequently <coughs> attended by the public. Um, so again, we have already spoken on this issue. This committee is asked to be informed, aware of the agenda items, because when these high audit uh, items go for vote, and our council representatives who appointed us expect us to know better, we're dumb. We don't know better. We're in the dark. It's a blind spot. And uh, that's why I'm acting who I'm acting, because y'all don't, y'all aren't getting it. But when council starts speaking against us formally, making us look like we're incompetent, incapable, please, no, uh-uh. It goes back to the staff issue. We ask for the information, give it to us. And, 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 and so that way we can then get 
to the to the part of the problem here. I loved your presentation. Are you you have more slides? I just have a couple more. Okay. We can then it's just task orders. We have a similar uh, similar type of process that are mostly awarded by low bids and also sometimes by CSPs, and that's our task order contracts. And I just wanted to provide a little bit of clarity because they're a little bit different than our JOC projects. They're mostly used for horizontal work, and um, and they're competitively procured as well. And they vary in size from about two hundred and fifty thousand when we're trying to debundle in order to provide some additional opportunity to about ten million. Every once in a while they're a little bit over that, but that's our average. And these ones are all awarded individually. Um, so that's one of the main points to understand as opposed to our JFC where we solicit and then we have ten in a pool of ten. So and then the unit pricing is submitted in the contractor's bid, but that's it. So do you all have any questions for me? Any additional yeah, ones? Yeah, Please have a copy of the PowerPoint. Oh, that's uh, cool. I mean, it's already been. I mean, it has been provided to EDD. I'm sure that they will send. Yeah, we'll email out the. Can we also get a copy for the Fair Contracting Coalition? Yes, we will copy you on the. Email. Could you could you go back to the other slide when you just came on? Uh, this one? Yes. I'll yeah. award it individually. Is there a dollar amount with which you're actually limited to individually? It's, it depends. Um, so however we solicit it out, um, we typically have an estimate, and then most of these we get a low bid. And then however amount that bid comes in for, then that's awarded to council. Anything above 50000 goes to council. We do very few informals in TCI, so almost everything that we have goes to council. And um, so let me make sure I understand. The awarded individual will be in the amount less than 250000 No, the awarded amount to the individual would be whatever their bid is. So if we, let's say we have a sidewalks contract, for example, and our estimate is around a million, and the bid comes in and it's 1250000 we will go ahead and award it that $1,250,000. So the only time that there's any other threshold is if we do an RFCSP for this type of horizontal work and we're doing something along those lines, then there's a statute where we can't exceed 1.5 million for something that's a commonplace horizontal project. That was my, I guess I didn't ask it correctly, what is the threshold to be able to award it individually? So most of ours are done individually. Almost all of TCIs with the exception of our RFQs, some of our RFCSPs, and um, that's about it. But all of our low bids are always awarded out to whomever is the lowest bidder. But there's no asking. threshold. Right that's now. what I was asking. You. Not for low bids. There are no thresholds for low bids. Anything over fifty thousand, we bid it out. Goes to council. I'm, 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 I'm not under this. So I'm sorry. I'm not interested in your question because I was telling Michael. I thought maybe your question was if our estimates a million. And someone bids below that, are we required to pay millions? Is that what is that? Well, it says awarded individually. Is it, and you're talking about if it's not. Um, Which is the, what was the threshold? Is, is there an amount, like you stated, anything more than 50000 has Because, yes. yes that's by, you know, that's by yes. Uh, state statute. Okay. So anything that's over, I don't have the discretion to award outside of accounting process. If it is under 50, we do have the authority, but I think what Kelsey is saying, their line of work is nothing, it's $50,000 typically. Right. It's very, very uh, So right. other departments do have a number of contracts that are under 50 that may be uh, executed by the city manager's office. And actually, uh, at $25,000, a director of a department can approve at 50 city manager. That's by state statute and also by our own administration. Yeah, hello. Anything else? Yep, any other questions for me? So, um, in terms of uh, when you have the, the job contract uh, contractors and they're doing these projects, does CCI have a formal evaluation process at the conclusion of each of these projects that you, um, that you evaluate these contractors? We have a scorecard process um, where and various uh, meetings and so on, that is something that we are looking at potentially improving. Yeah, because um, in this process, uh, when one of your uh, 
African American contractors uh, brought to the was brought to their attention in their debrief that I did attend, that um, project managers were uh, happy with work that they had done three years ago, and uh, that collection of data, you know, really came out, out outside of the uh, the board or the evaluation process. It disturbed me that we would go back to departments and try to figure out, you know, why we're justifying why you know a certain company didn't uh, make the mark. And I, I thought that sophistication of TCI should have a formal, you know, folder of evaluation of completed projects that, you know, job well done or, or not. So in the end, there was no form of a uh, reference that they could actually put their hands on. So I asked for if there was any derogatory information that was contained in this one company's file. No. But yet, we're going to go off of anecdotal information from a project management crew and not have a sophisticated enough process to where we have evaluation at the completion of each project. So it keeps y'all honest, it keeps the contractor honest, it keeps the taxpayers feeling good that our money is being uh, spent the right way. And, and so I asked that question because that random stuff don't work and um, and we do <coughs> better approve that. I have a million more questions for you and I'll submit them to, to the department. And you know I have a lot of questions because um, I, again, I went back to the objectivity piece if, if someone says that this process, this scoring was flawed, I'm again asking the question, who can call a foul of foul in this process? Because the, the, the city manager's office was on the board. So the city manager can't do it. So who's going to do it? And, and how do we define that in the city policy? I don't know. I'm just saying that if I was a company that had bid on a project and I don't see where the process worked for me, then who do I go to? Who do I go to? Okay, so you're asking city council, but city council is not staff. And the best they can do is go back and say, well, well, you guys approved, you guys recommended it, city manager recommended it. Of course, well, the city manager was on the board. And, and let me just mention, Chairman, I, I, I fully understand what you're saying. There, there's some tough issues in between there and my own sort of large policy discussion. Yesterday, there was a similar contract that was not similar, but a contract that was awarded that had similar issues, similar questions. And we've always had the policy, and I'll, I'll, I'll hold as best as I can uh, what was conveyed by one of our assistant city managers because it's true. Uh, if a project is going to have a high dollar value or be a high profile contract, uh, someone from the city manager's office is going to be on that evaluation. That is for, uh, in order to have a certain amount of um, accountability that this was looked at at a high level. And then you're going to have the director of the department that's in charge of that contract on there as well for the same reason. After that, you're going to get a number of uh, subject matter experts. And, you know, that was the point in contention, in contention uh, yesterday. That was public, so that's all public. Uh, regarding well, who's a subject matter expert, there is some sub subjectivity in there. However, when you're dealing with construction work in this town, and, and if you're going to be an evaluator, your company cannot be part of the, the evaluation committee, of course. So, the next best thing are those that have had the experience doing these things. And then, you know, to that other point, which I can fully acknowledge. Doing business with the city is kind of a double-edged sword because if you do a great job, that's a great reference to have, and if you do a bad job, that's also uh, a bad. You know, that's, it, it works <coughs> against you. But as you were saying, let it be what it is, and, and, and whatever uh, you know, whatever results are from the work experience, it should, it should be counted. So, um, just to add, uh, the, the subject matter expert really needs to be someone from outside of the city because uh, we, if you have a board like or an evaluation like this where everybody's in the city then the city can basically pick who they want based off of and that's why I was saying before that reprisal piece happens during selection processes and, and there's no way that you can honestly say that there was an outside person who it was objective said, hey, they got a fair shot. You, you, you can't. We can't at this point. We've, what's already happened, happened. But moving forward, we have to validate and have a process that does not allow um, our small minority women owned, veteran owned businesses to be picked off based off of a like or dislike or preference or, or whatever. Because
because that's irritating. And that's, that's kind of what I'm saying I saw. But again, uh, the process worked and it's uh, something that the department's happy with. But again, we just have to be mindful that uh, this is not easy work. Chairman, can I advocate for my city for a moment here and just say, beyond those committee members, there is an advisory uh, person involved, and that's usually somebody from the city attorney's office. As an attorney, if I saw something going on that was wrong, I would definitely have to do it. Whether it's the city manager's office or any department. That being said, there are a number of other solicitations where there are outside members brought in. Uh, with the understanding that you become part of the process, you cannot be on the honor on the work of the evaluation. Uh, so uh, that's a valid suggestion. Well, high value contracts, I, you know, I think all deserve that type of level of consideration. I mean, high value contracts, that's why the council entrusts the staff to be able to do this right. And, and again, I'm saying on the record, I don't, I don't see this last job board Oops. contract as being right. I don't believe that it, it had uh, the integrity that I'm looking for in a process. <clears throat> a retired U.S. Air Force officer who uh, was a human resources officer who had a lot of experience dealing with promotion boards and all all those things and where we had to have uh, fairness. I'm not seeing it within our city's process. I'm not going to lie and I'm not going to sugarcoat it. I'm not going to say it uh, differently. We have flaws in the process. And as humans, you know, we can make mistakes. I get that. But we can't have mistakes happen as a part of the of the system. We can eliminate the system problems. All right, let's move on. The next item is uh Jay Uh, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. <laughs> yeah, I actually shoot you okay, thank on this one. Thank you so much. Um, so after the last meeting, SPAC, we have SPAC formally requested that we send an email to JNT Paving asking them if they had any questions or any issues that had brought up. So I had reached out to um, as, um, JNT Paving asking them questions and specifically, and I'm just going to read out the email. This was um, almost four days after the SPAC meeting. Uh, good afternoon, Ms. Ashley. I'm just following up from the SPAC meeting that you and your colleagues attended on February 8th at the Central Library. For the instructions of the committee, would you please provide us your questions in written for review of the City of San Antonio Department? The response that I received was on uh, February 11th. It said, thank you for reaching out. I do not believe that JNP had any questions. We just wanted to make sure that our concerns were I followed up the same day. Um, thank you, Ms. Ashley, for your response. If there are any other issues that you would uh, like small business office to look into, for instance, how the rain delays are granted or the fines that were levied for the project delays, we would be happy to help. The response that we received the same day was no. We have all the information, and that hasn't been really one of our issues. So we forwarded that email to the chair. Uh, we did proceed uh, it on the agenda item as requested by you all this motion, but as that was the decision. Okay, thank you. Um, part of the citizens, you heard, piece, uh, you heard several people talk about uh, JP uh, bringing, uh, and I'll say his name, he's here, Mr. Calvert, uh, Andrew Kovac, Jose Tabaka, to uh, their a hearing and so uh, I knew that was an issue I sent an email back to TCI's interim director he provided me with his email response I highlighted the fact that we don't have a city policy that's what the interim director said now let me say this I'm gonna say it I'm gonna say it loud and clear when uh, small minority women owned businesses say business rolling business decide that he wants to bring Chris to the meeting because that's what he wants. There's no way, shape, or form that the city staff knows if I'm a 1% <coughs> partner of Roland's business or I may be no relation to Roland's business or I just may be the person who he wants to advocate you know, on his behalf because maybe he knows that that's my skill set. That's his business. And so for any department to say that we're going to cancel and shut down a meeting based off of 
that director's preference is ridiculous and wrong. If we live in the United States of America, which I think is where we live, we do have the right of freedom of speech. And we exercise that when we sit down at the table to say exactly what is disturbing us or what isn't. So um, the citizens, when they spoke, were absolutely right. That's why I asked that question formally. I'm proud of the director for answering, answering the question the right way. Um, and so that's really how it should work. Um, Pre-brief meetings, hearings, uh, feedback to evaluations from, from various uh, bid selections, all that, you know, who I bring to the table is my business. Now, if you want to regulate that, then let's get the city council to put some form of policy together where we say we're going to censor businesses. And I'm sure that's an option because we're in a democracy. But that disappointed me when I heard that. And, uh, and I've been going to meetings. Let me say this. I've been going to meetings with companies. So I've been sitting here now thinking to myself, as I sit here, Randy, with these, with these departments, am I sitting here because I'm the SBAC chair and they respect that? Or if I wasn't on the SBAC and I sat down with these companies, would they throw me out too? I don't know. So when the attorney asked the question, well, what pastor do you meet with the city manager? I don't know. He asked me. Just maybe Chris Heron that he wants to meet with, with no titles. So I don't know. All I'm saying is that the staff can't make the assumption on things like this anymore. So now on the record, we have the information. Unless I'm going to be corrected, we'll move forward, and that's the truth. The issues with JMP paving, um, those are questions with the SBAC asks. So are, is there any uh, issues that y'all have that you want to address? Because I'm done talking about JMP paving, but I do know that um, when I heard about the fine and I asked the question whether or not other companies had also been late, yes, other companies, they have they been fined? No. So then what's the disparity in treatment, right? Is it because it's a Hispanic business? I don't know. He's wildly successful now. Maybe there's some, I don't know how jealousy works within the staff. I don't know how envy works, but I know that it's dangerous. So anything anybody wants to say? We can move on. Yes, TCI. Yes. So I think um, when the comments are made, they're concerning to us. And so I think it would be beneficial if we sat down and discussed them in person. And, you know, for example, if, if you were told not to work because of rain and then you saw another contractor working, I would want to know those details so we can address it. Um, and so my intent is to reach out to... Should I reach out to Ashley De La Rosa? Yes. Okay, to arrange something so we can sit down and have those conversations. I think that's important. If they're being made, we need to address them. Who was kicked out of the meeting? Mr. Calvert, uh, Rosie Baca, and then one gentleman, Andrew Colbert. Andrew Colbert. Three of us. And we weren't there to say anything. We just wanted to see how the city attorney's office and the TCI office, what they were saying, their body language, and how they treat the people from Jim. We were there to monitor them. Was it? I was kicked out of two meetings. I'm sorry. I was I, kicked out of two so meetings. So was there an attorney present on either end? Uh, yes, there was. She's a judge now. Okay. So one of the. So one of the. I guess what I what I would mention to that is that one of the state law requirements is that if you're going to bring an attorney to a meeting, please notify our office because that in turn requires us to at least have they are representation they the trust that. And well, you know, and and this is not in this particular case, but no, uh, many well, let's folks, just agree to disagree. Many folks here. You guys always want to implement and say things that are not true. You're being very false right now, and you're a city attorney. What I'm saying is I'm stating the state bar rules. Which Steve, are, didn't, it, did, didn't they know the lawyer was coming to those meetings? Yeah. yeah. But they didn't, they didn't ask the lawyer to leave. They just asked him to leave. Yeah. 
Yeah, so the yeah, they didn't ask the Lord if he should be pray on face again. Okay. It's the same the thing. There and, and again, Mr. Coward, what I'm going to tell you is what is basically in the state bar rules. I, I don't what care what's in the state bar rules. Well, you guys can I interpret the rules. Calvary. You can interpret the rules the way you want to. I think to clarify what I'm hearing, just to taxpayers' money. TC, what I think I'm hearing, and I think other this meeting, I think you're saying that everything might have been followed at this meeting and TC was right and, and they were there and whatnot, but on future meetings if an attorney's going to be present just to be notified. Well, that's that was my intent, but I, I am, like like I'm saying, a lot of times folks can wear many hats, but at the same time I think it's it should be incumbent if you're going to bring an attorney to let us know. That way we can have staff's representation there as well because I, I, I can empathize with staff sitting down to have an, uh, an open candid meeting and then having an attorney be on the other end and not really feeling comfortable. To so what, the what we're seeing is going in one ear and out the other. I'm uh, sitting here listening to you. You know, everybody listen, listen. Listen to what he's saying. The attorney didn't get kicked out of the meeting. I got kicked out of the meeting. Rosie Baca got kicked out of the meeting. And Andrew Kovac got kicked out of the meeting. Not, not the attorney. Okay, so You're way off base. Question. Well, Vice Chair. I guess so my question should be, was it an open meeting? Was in a public meeting. Is and please here? allow me to finish. And the reason is one, if it was an open meeting, I can see your justification. Exactly. If it was a private meeting, then I can also see their justification. What, what is a private exactly. meeting? Because when you say yes. private, this is a, a closed, Was it a closed meeting right. or was it a public It was an administrative hearing. Administrative hearing. So, so can I can break you want. Want. Can, well, can I can I clarify that please? Because yes. an open meeting in in the Texas Open Meetings Act means something completely different. It means I have to post 72 hours a day, which means that there's going to be members of a governing board who actually have authority to make decisions be there. Other than that, there are uh, all the meetings that we have that are business meetings are private meetings. Now, I, I, and, and, you know, I know that Christy and, and Kelsey and Rozzy and everyone there are doing their best. We have advised against calling that an administrative hearing because that means something different if you're a lawyer. An administrative hearing on, on you know, through the administrative code is a whole nother meeting aside from a private meeting. Uh, an administrative hearing is governed by statutory law and has requirements and you're required to go that avenue before you take your next step. They call that those meetings administrative hearings, but actually they're not required to have those meetings at all. But they, 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 the department wants to have those meetings with those businesses for the purpose of just getting additional information or addressing issues that might be made. So the second part of that is to ensure that this not happen, what are what could we categorize those meetings? What so, would be best in the benefit of the of J and P, is that correct? Mm -hmm. And those who are coming in just enough and observing. Um, uh, so, if you open the door to who can observe, well, if, if, if Mr. Calvert's saying, I don't have anything to do, I'm just there to observe, and we say, okay, come on in, uh, and then a media member says, I'm just there to observe, I'm, I, I, it's difficult to draw the line. Well, in this case, J.P. Pave invited Mr. Calvert to go with him, so I don't want to make it seem like Mr. Calvert was a fly on the wall and he decided he wanted to walk in. These folks all came with J.P. Pave. So, so that was who they chose. That's their team. That's and that's why I'm saying again, and, and we're going to cut this. The city does not determine who walks in the door with the company. That's just unless you can give me a policy statement, then then and then for all the small businesses that are listening, you bring who you want to the table that makes you feel comfortable, so you can work through the issues appropriately. That's it. That's common sense. Let me just say for the record to the uh, S back board, Mr. Jaime Mark. Jaime Rios of J.P. Payton is a founding member of the Fair Contracting Coalition. I rest my case. Randy, so, last one. Okay. So I've got a couple questions. What was this meeting called? Well, that was a call. Well, at the time, what well, did J.P. Payton? From J.P. It was an administrative <laughs> hearing. Okay. It was called an administrative oh, yes. hearing. And was J and T paving call to this hearing, or was JMP was called in for an administrative hearing, and he called in J and T. Calls in uh, for those. Oh. No, he's the city. Yeah. The city. The letter is TCI. 
Yeah, TCI. TCI called it in. We coordinate with them okay. on their availability. All right. And when the when all the parties were there who were called to the meeting, was there an attorney from the city there? Not at the time. Um, whenever um, JP showed up and they had their attorney, then we called our attorney to come over. Okay, and your the city attorney came over. Yes. One of the assistant city attorneys. Okay, but there was an attorney who was past the bar and all that kind of stuff. Yes, absolutely. Oh, okay. So there was an attorney there present. I don't care what his grade was. He's an attorney. Okay. So, so my at that point in time. All the parties that had called the meeting, J and P showed up with their attorney. The city had an attorney there. What you know? What's the problem? The person that called the meeting, TCI, the city of San Antonio. They are the ones that suggested that members of the public leave. Is that, is that correct? Not present. I was present. Yeah. So. At the time, um, I'm the one who read the letter, and, and we typically ask to be notified if anybody else is going to be coming. We had the meeting, the FCC was there, and then we had a discussion on, and my first we came in, on if um, we wanted to proceed in the same way, let's reschedule, since staff have been surprised by this. Uh, I, I understand that. They walked in with their attorney. Mm -hmm. You weren't notified, Correct. but you were you <coughs> solved the problem by having a city attorney there. Exactly. And so, what was the reason for having Mr. Calvert and the other people leave? What was the reason? So, our administrative hearings are traditionally, and, and right, I'm going to ask you to speak to this a little bit more, an opportunity for us to have a very candid and free flowing conversation to try to determine whether or not we want to move forward with a contractor. We offered at that time, if we still wanted to have the FCC there, we could postpone and go ahead and regroup, have a larger room since we all were a little overcrowded in there, and be prepared. Um, or if we wanted to move forward that day, that Mr. Calvert and the rest of the FCC were more than welcome to meet with um, with Mike Frisbee and other staff at that time while we continue. Okay, okay so hearing. we're kind of, in my opinion, and I don't know anything right. about what was going on in there, but in my opinion, if you needed a bigger room, you can get a bigger room. Right. If you needed to crank up the AC, you can crank it up. But based on what you're telling me, and what I think I heard is that this was an administrative hearing, and was it per definition or was it not? No. No, they call that, and, and, and you know what, I mean, our office has okay. had some discussion. They so, call it an administrator. We could call it anything, and what it basically was was an opportunity to meet and discuss. It, it, it sounds to me like it was a very subjective terminology, and in the case here, it's it was a subjective decision to say, no, this is an administrative hearing, we need to... Forget this. You guys can leave because you're not attorneys. I, I just there's a lot of gray area here, and you know we deal with gray area, but I think attorneys don't. So it's either an administrative hearing or it's not. So okay, so then I don't see a reason. I'm not an attorney. I can play a great one on television, <laughs> but there was no reason, in my opinion, that these people should have been asked to leave. Exactly. <laughs> And Chairman, I, I appreciate that you're wanting to uh, move on. If I made one statement, it would be that uh, keep in mind that the uh, city staff is really there and can talk to the points of the contract. But I would really, as as city attorney's office, I'd stress that they're not there to make policy. They're not there to implement policy. Our policy board is our city council, and we implement what they approve and what they what they. Uh, uh, you know, what they what they looked at. So, in some of those meetings, they, it's almost like uh, if, if, if two contractors are meeting, or two folks in a, in a relationship, a contractual relationship, are meeting to discuss the contract. Uh, 
I think those individuals involved in the contract at that time should be able to have that discussion. Now, if it elevates to the point where you need to bring your lawyer because we're thinking of taking legal action on this contract, of course, bring your attorney. We'll let you know that we're going to be there. Uh, you should be there as well. But it's, it's again, again, uh, a gray area between I'm going to allow, uh, you know, this group or that group, the media group, the councilman, I'm going to allow the uh, county commissioner, I'm going to allow uh, the governor to attend this meeting. Yeah, yeah, you, you, we, it's, it's difficult for staff who serves at this level and, you know, who they're going to be with. It, put, it puts us in a tough but as, we said, but as we said, there's no policy. And that's what, I, if, if I were to treat that piece, I'd say you're absolutely right. There is no policy. There are procedures that we follow, and and I would ask, and I'm yeah, going to recommend it up here. that TCA, TCI uh, revises that procedure. As far as, I, as far as I know, this is being recorded, and Ms. Young just stood up and said that the reason for the meeting was to have a candid conversation yes. about this issue. Okay. It was called an administrative hearing, but it wasn't. Okay. And so, with that case, clarity is power. And we're either going to have a veil of secrecy or we're going to have transparency in this whole thing. Right. Okay. Right. So, and I had nothing to do with their business, nothing to do with the foundation. I'm just a public person who is trying to use a little bit of the gray matter. And, Counselor, these are citizens. And this is, I'm going to tell you, this is what gives the city or any administrative body a black eye. I spent 15 years as a school board member in the city, 10 of those years as a board president. And unless the leader of that group, I, as board president, say, now, in accordance with the Texas Open Meetings Act, Section 551.074, we're going into closed session. This is the public's meeting. Let it. I don't know how his presence or her presence or Mr. Kovacs' presence would preclude you from having an open and frank discussion. I think you're assuming that they would be disruptive and stop that process. Thank you. Thank you. I'm sorry. Okay. I just wanted to clarify. It wasn't uh, well, No, I'm just going by what you just said, that you're, the goal was to have an open and frank discussion. So whomever decided, it sounds like that they decided, arbitrarily, Counselor, decided that their presence, forget the attorney, because that's been nullified because you brought your own attorney in, you said. So they, you had an attorney, they had an attorney, so, so two attorneys were there. So that's off the table. The fact that these citizens were, were excluded I'm gonna, from the I'm going to give uh, 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 Roland the last word, and then uh, we're going to then go to uh, the next. So after you speak, Michael Sinden will speak. Um, just listening to everybody, it sounds like it was not a hearing, but maybe an informal conference to uh, sort of have a meeting of the minds. There's procedural ways. If, if the concern is somebody's going to bring in their attorney and you know lawyer up, and perhaps that information is going to be used against the party, whether it be a municipality or, or a different party, you know there are procedural steps you can take. Get everybody to sign a, 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 a TRE for a wage statement where that information can't be used against them. So you can have a candid, frank conversation without kicking anybody out of the room. And so I think that might be something that could be helpful. In other words, let's have this open, engaging dialogue. None of this information that we Exchange here can be used to give a little talk and sit down and talk. And that might be a policy consideration that, that they could use moving forward. You're, you're right. Mm -hmm. uh, it just notches up that meeting when it's going. Sure. I right. think it takes it down actually because if, if, it's, a, if, it's, if, it's, a, if it's a TRE for a wait, you're basically saying you and I are going to talk and we're going to try to hash it out in the room. But nothing we say can be used against each other legally. You yeah. know what I'm talking about. The core yeah, right? I know. Yeah, that and, works. and it, it works. I mean, it's yeah. definitely effective to have those kind of discussions. I think the I think we would probably go through ten of those a day if we if we, yeah. if we implemented it today. Uh, well, uh, okay, I'm going to move on to the next item. But whether it's ten a day or whether it's TCI who has a thousand work orders in which we don't have an evaluation process to go through, the work, we got to do the work. The city staff has to do the work. Laziness will never be an excuse of our city. We'll grow the city staff before we're going to commit to being lazy. We're not doing our jobs. Michael, report card. Uh, the next item is the FCC report card. It's kind of convenient to see how we're doing this today. So I just wanted to give you all a heads up. Uh, almost annually, the FCC uh, 
uh, request entities submit their utilization information of small minority owned businesses to be scored like a test. Uh, basically, you get your A, T, C, Ds, and Fs. Um, and they're about to release one, I believe, this month. Well, what we're doing is we're allowing to show a real fair. Those that were late getting their report card in, we've extended the time for them. Those that got a failing grade, we've allowed them, Mr. City Attorney, to go back and look at their data and bring data that they did not submit for 2017. So we're being very transparent. We're being very fair because we are going to be going to the editorial board of Express News, the editorial board of San Antonio Business Journal. So we want to be fair, civility, to all these tax and entities. By the way, the city of San Antonio received a B. They got a B on the report card. But they got all these other little problems like kicking people out of meetings. So basically, we have, I think, three or four people, board members, that have not responded. And they haven't responded since 2016. So it means they're trying to hide something. The Northside Independent School District, yeah, I called them all. Northeast Independent School District, UTSA did respond this week. And we had San Antonio Independent School District, but the San Antonio Independent School District has responded. As a matter of fact, we just received their data two days ago. So out of a 16 different uh, tax supported entities, we only have maybe three or four that have not responded. But the main ones that we're going to go after, we're going to embarrass them. City Attorney, they're going to get embarrassed. Northside Independent School District has known about this since 2016. I repeat, 2016. Thank you, Mr. Cowell. I'd like to appeal our beat, I think. <laughs> <laughs> so, <laughs> the purpose of this was A, to inform you that this is coming out. TC does a very good job at getting media attention on this for the right reasons to make sure other entities are producing results similar to currently what the city's producing, which is our record numbers. Um, I will be submitting a letter to the FCC about the score, not so much protesting the B, but it's a request in the future to make sure there is fairness and parity amongst sure. all the entities. And I just wanted to inform you that that was going to be submitted, no doubt. We have issues, but I like to think that as a city and where we've progressed, we're dealing with these nuanced things one by one instead of the overall issue where we were literally at 13% utilization just eight years ago. So some of the things I'm going to ask uh, in the future evaluations of the scorecard is just that certifications, how folks count people, sure. they use the certification agency. Sure. And I only bring it up because allowing someone to misrepresent <coughs> Sure. They claim to be an agent owned business and own 10% of the company. I got you. Or woman owned. Um, other things is making sure everybody's local. Sure. I looked up a lot of folks' policies, and you're allowed to count a Chicago minority owned business. Mm -hmm. we, we, Chicago's great and all, but we want to help folks here before we start looking totally elsewhere. Agree. Um, some other things, uh, making sure no double counting's happening, meaning if someone's a minority and a woman, they fall in one bucket. Totally um, and then actually that there's actual payments uh, being reported instead of awards. Um, that ensures things like in Jane's case. That's not ideal, Sure. but we are not going to count that contract as the $886,000. It's going to count as that whatever she got, the 50%, because that is an error, and I shouldn't be getting credit for that extra piece. Totally um, and, and through looking through some policies of some organizations, I noticed, um, and the only reason I bring this up is because that's how we're scored. We're compared against other people's. Uh -huh. Percentages. So if they're inflating them, if you will, we're graded more negatively. And and um, what I saw one policy of one organization where it basically said if the contract has 51% or greater minority women on business utilization at the sub level, the entire contract will count as 100%. And I, if I will not allow that. If it's at 51%, it's at 51%. If it's at 10, it's at 10. If it's at 99 and one person's not, it's at 99. And so these are the things, and I would ask support of the board to actually maybe submit this letter on behalf of myself because I think y'all carry more credibility than I do. So that was my request. You know, God, let me just say this. Uh, first of all, and I want to say this in uh, credit to the city, so you won't think I'm just trying to be the city. We have told CPS Energy, 
San Antonio water system, University Hill system, Bear County, to all adopt the city of San Antonio's diversity action plan because of the fine job that we did in putting thousands and thousands with Sue Payne and members around this table. I promote city attorney, the city's policies, because you actually have the best one of all the agencies in this city. And, and now, and, and let me say this. One for the state let me just well. say this. Let me just say sure. this to you, in all fairness to you. You really, since the city public service people give you forty percent of their money, you all need to be on top of them, like white on ice, telling them to adopt the policy. Because guess what? They don't have one, mm -hmm. and they're all over the road. So <coughs> if you really want to be a hero, with a <coughs> you really need to help your brothers and sisters over at CPS Energy. But we brag. Let me tell you, Michael Sinden and Amanda Rayner, they get an A in my book. Because this young man, and I say this from the bottom of my heart, you come to all our meetings, you give us fairness, not like other people who want us to fudge the numbers. We've had big agencies. I was in a meeting this week with a big agency, and I'll tell you who it was. It was Saul's. Saul's. Wanted us to use the same numbers we used back in 2016. We're not doing it. Our scoring matrix is very, very simple. It's one and one is two. Two and two is four. It's just like in high school when you get a grade. We've kept our scoring matrix very, very simple. It's not the same scoring matrix soon that we used back in 2016. Because people were able to fudge those numbers. Michael, you know what I'm talking about. We got a Look, i got a very sharp team, Mr. Herring, and a lot of people that's on that scoring big team, a gentleman by the name of Richard Costa, they do an outstanding job. This group needs to understand, Mr. City Attorney, we don't get paid to do this. We're all volunteers. We're all ratepayers. And we've been around for 10 years now with this report card. So you guys got to give us some respect, too. And it's the only accountability we have. But we brag all the time, and a lot of the members around this table can tell you, I've told the big dogs at CPS, I've told the big dogs at the University Health System, why don't you call Michael Sinden yep. and let him help you with the policy? Because okay. you don't have a policy. Mm -hmm. And to conclude on that, DC, I really appreciate what y'all do through the scorecard. What you're saying right now has sparked discussion with all the other entities because of the report card the first time around. So what you're doing is allowing us to educate, and I thank you for that. Thank you. I, I want to say, uh, then we're going to move to our next item. But um, when I think about the report card and, and this grade, I'm also saying again, uh, with the first line item that we had with the uh, EDF discussion, uh, CPS Energy is on the EDF board. The City of San Antonio is on the EDF board. Uh, UTSA is on the EDF board. Uh, Bear County board. The four taxpaying entities that sit in the decision making on the EDS board. And so again, when we talk about African American Chamber of Commerce is not being able to sit at the table, or Asian American Chamber of Commerce is not being able to sit at the table, or they want to impose a ten thousand, twenty thousand dollar membership that you have to pay in order to play, that's wrong. And that's my experience. That's why I say those leaders that we pay need to be held accountable. Next topic is uh, is the diversity action subcommittee. Uh, our chair is not available. <coughs> we'll pass that if y'all don't mind. And then, um, and then, so now we're going to go into uh, upcoming events, and the city has that. So on events, I just want to give y'all some very unfortunate and sad news. Um, usually, Amanda Reyna would be doing this, and Amanda Reyna is no longer with the Economic Development Department. She has received a promotion oh, wow. to support Dr. Colleen Bridger, who is now ascended from the Director of Metro Health uh, to an Assistant City Manager. So Amanda is her executive assistant, and that change was made really fast uh, within about three business days, to be quite honest. So we're going to do our best to continue this effort. Um, I'm not allowed to hire anybody for a few months. <coughs> we're going to have staff try to split up the responsibilities and duties. That being said, the opportunities we have on here, business opportunities for Texans um, at the El Tropicano Hotel. That already happened on Tuesday, March 19th, so we'll correct that. That was because the agenda was supposed to be for last Friday during spring break. I apologize. 
And then there was an HCA mixer we went to on March 20th where we brought all of the different uh, departments with us to educate that membership on how to do business with the city. So it was very productive. Mr. Chairman, can I make an announcement? Yes. The Fair Contracting Coalition will be meeting on this coming uh, March the uh, 27th. And uh, our meeting starts at 9.59. We will be honoring uh, Mr. Richard Leal, the owner of Atlas Paint and Body. He's given us free office space, free meeting room, free administrative uh, help. And so we want to honor him for all the work that he's done in helping champion small minority business. So all of you are welcome. Uh, we have uh, uh, free uh, breakfast and free lunch that's being uh, sponsored by Straight Line Management uh, for that particular uh, uh, event. So uh, it's going to be an exciting meeting, and we're looking forward to the big opportunities that the city's going to be presenting to us that day. Mr. Herring's one of our speakers, and uh, we just have our meetings are very exciting. Thank you. We're, we're going to have that to uh, the calendar. Uh, I'll also submit two uh, items from uh, Global Chamber of San Antonio, um, who does not have a relationship with our city formally. Uh, but uh, we have the third annual Contemporary African Affairs Symposium uh, that will be held at Texas State University. Um, and uh, that will be uh, May uh, to 24 May of 2019. And then also we have a spring membership reception uh, uh, local chamber with the San Antonio Council for International Visitors. Uh, he does a lot of State Department handholding with people who are coming into our uh, city. Uh, we have uh, an invitation to you to attend on April the 10th uh, at 6 p.m. to 7.30 p.m. at the Holiday Inn Riverwalk Hotel. And in that uh, audience, we will have members of visitors from Mexico, Chile, Colombia, Dominican Republic, Ecuador, Guatemala, Peru, uh, Bosnia, uh, Cyprus, Greece, Hungary, Kosovo, uh, Macedonia, uh, Romania, Serbia, Slovenia. So this is what the Global Chamber is, is doing, uh, I guess under the radar. But we're trying to provide value to our city's uh, international economic development plan. And this is why, again, uh, Global Chamber is not a part of the EDF. We've never been invited to be on their board, even though my board members have asked. Um, we want to uh, make sure that we're working with second stage companies uh, because uh, there's really no laser focus on it. And that's as the executive director, I know we can do that. So are there any other uh, calendar items for the, for the agenda? Okay. So the next item is what? Future business. So uh, uh, we've already added uh, a couple, but I would like to uh, see uh, Councilman John Courage, uh, who is the, the chair of the High Audit Committee, to uh, be invited uh, to uh, to talk to us about uh, the, his committee and, and, and how that works. Uh, there are also two citizens that are appointed uh, to that uh, that committee, and I would like for them to be sent the invitation so they can develop a relationship with us. Um, yes, and then we also. Uh, Vice Chair, so I want to see the equity officer uh, of the city of San Antonio to be invited to the next meeting. Uh, we do need to get back to the uh, meat potatoes, which is uh, to see the department spending status, right? Um, because we need to know if our city departments are on track with uh, our swim meetings. And let's open the meeting with that so we can kind of look at that like we used to. Um, uh, by boards was also an item that we said that we want to. Uh, you know, let's put that at the end of the agenda, and, 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 uh, and then uh, let's see. We also asked, we also voted on um, uh, with the city manager to uh, let's work to see about aligning the local uh, the local preference and the veterans preference programs that fall under the SBAC. Uh, we took a vote, uh, and that vote conveyed that we wanted to see those uh, ordinances realigned to us. So uh, we need to have an update on that. And then the procurement for preference program update. Uh, I got a, 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 an email from Norbert from Finance. Um, and to me, the procurement preference program uh, is like what Walmart does, where they have rollbacks. 
and people like rollbacks when it comes to TVs and stuff. But when it comes to the Cebada ordinance, we don't like rollbacks. So we need to have an update to uh, what the procurement preference program that the city is uh, going to do. Now, also for the SPAC's uh, knowledge, uh, they're going to do a survey, supposedly, for this procurement preference program. And I'm going to say, I don't care what everyone else thinks out there about uh, the Cebada program. Because when they came and they asked us as we would reduce our points to make it so that they could do what they need to do, that to me showed us right there that they're going to use surveys in a way to say, well, everyone thinks that we should do this as a city, and um, but we know the heart and soul of what we have made progress on came from the Cebada ordinance that said we have disparity in our marketplace. No survey can undo that, and we can't let the politics of surveys uh, monkey us around to where we're not able to continue to have justice and freedom for our people. Yes. Oh, and then also, uh, we'd like to have um, TCI to, uh, to provide us with uh, some new draft documents in terms of how they're going to evaluate uh, companies at the end of, uh, of, of various uh, projects, because uh, we need to see that. Michael. Um, the survey, I just want to make note that City Council recently adopted a policy where we have to include our civic engagement when, when looking at policies, and I believe surveying is part of that requirement. Um, so we're adopting to those standards they put before us to implement. The last thing, I'll work with Chris independently. I don't think we can get all those things on one agenda, so I'll try to work with you to prioritize. Being potatoes on departmental dashboards is important in my opinion, and I know historically those take a little while because there's about 30 to present, and each one can have a story, right? Because not everybody's as simple as TCI where it's roads and bridges and there's like ample opportunity. Sometimes it's an animal care, and we want to talk about that. So just, I'll prioritize with Chris and we'll, we'll work out the next few agendas. Nice share. One of the things is um, the request from my book that we support the letter that you'll be submitting to FCC uh, from so, um, SPAC. We will endorse all of them. Okay. Just want to make sure that it goes on record that was a request yeah, and that SBAC will be supporting my book in the department. Yeah. Hey, uh, what's next? The move second uh, meeting is now called Thank you so much. Uh, and thank you, thank you to the SBAC. Uh, and thank you to our citizens. Steve and Fred.